Welcome to Real Talk for Real Teachers. I'm Dr. Becky Bailey, the creator of Conscious Discipline, expert in child development and education, and a lifelong teacher and learner. For those listening who are not aware of Conscious Discipline, it is a comprehensive self-regulation program that integrates social-emotional learning, school culture, and discipline. In general, it provides adults and children with the skills to be disciplined enough to set and achieve goals, conscious enough to know when you're off track, and connected enough to others so you're willing to be persistent. So what are real teachers? Real teachers are people who have both a life inside and outside the classroom. Real teachers are the ones who count down the days to spring break, just like the students. Real teachers sometimes have hard times on Monday mornings, just like the students. Real teachers look forward to and can also dread the start of a new year, just like the students. Yet real teachers get up day after day and give their heart and soul to others. Real Talk for Real Teachers is a growing community of loving professionals who seek to love themselves as much as they love others. Now, Conscious Discipline is in its 20th year, and it has grown organically up during that time. We started years and years ago, and we were known as an early childhood program. Then we were known as an elementary school program. And now we're moving into middle school and in some places high school. So today we're going to be talking about Conscious Discipline in middle school. And I've invited Diane Phelan to talk with us, and she actually is the first person in this country to fully implement conscious discipline in a middle school. But she's been in education for 23 years, 14 years in an elementary school, nine years in a middle school, and she's currently principal of Keller Middle School in Pasadena, Texas. And she's in her fourth year of full implementation with conscious discipline. So welcome, Diane, to Real Talk with Real Teachers. Thank you so much, Dr. Bailey. It's an honor to be here. So first, let's get let's find out about your school. So tell us about Keller Middle School. Who do you serve and what's the school like? So we're a small town outside of Houston, Texas. Um, We are very we're right on the ship channel of Houston, Texas. So it's very industrial area. Uh, We have 89 percent of our students are on free and reduced lunch. We have about 90% of our students are Hispanic with probably 5 to 6% African American and 3% are, are Caucasian. We serve, um, we're in a community that has a lot of apartments. So we have a lot of um, students that move in and out of the school throughout the year, probably about uh, 40%. Wow. Transient, yeah, that move in and out. So um, so it's a, it's a fun population to work with, but it also has a lot of challenges as well. So how did you, how did you come across conscious discipline and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try this in middle school because I know for a fact, I saw you go to a school that was with four-year-olds. There were 419 four-year-olds in a school in Texas. Farias Elementary, and you walked, you came over to that school, watched it being done with four-year-olds, and then went home and said, hmm, I'm going to tweak this, and we're going to do it in middle school. Now, how does this come about in your head? What what caused you to land on conscious discipline and say, I can do this? Well, actually, we had had some one-day trainings in the district that were offered district-wide, and the presenter was just outstanding. And so anytime she presented in our district, um, we, myself and my counselor, and at the time we were at a different school. We were at, um, when she was presenting, we were at another campus. I was an assistant principal. It was an elementary school. And so, uh, we would go over there and listen to her and try to implement just tiny little pieces of conscious discipline. So we knew, I knew that I liked what that offered. When I became a principal, um, I brought that same speaker over to our campus. And for a few years, I would ask, hey, where is there in Texas that we can go look? What schools can we go to? What <laughs> schools can we go to? You know, like everybody asks. And so it was Farias. I mean, it was interesting that that's, that's where it was. And I was like, in my head, I'm not going to learn anything from a pre-K school, you know. 
And in reality, when we went there, I could just see and and feel that we could do what they were doing for the four-year-olds um, for our kids. I could see the benefit in the structures and the, the, the way it was time managed, what they were doing with the teachers and how, how it had been rolled out. And we had already started some of that because we did have a lot of secondary teachers in our building. And so, you know, a lot of them start structures inside the classrooms and we were starting to do some of those structures with our teachers first. And so I knew I could do that. And that's what I learned really a lot from that principal at that, that early childhood center was how she started it and rolled it out. So now, you know, since, you know, I've always had a problem with conscious discipline because if I talk to early childhood people, they say, oh, it's an early childhood program. It's not an elementary. If I talk to elementary, they say it's an elementary. It's not an early childhood. If I talk to special ed, it's, oh, it's for special ed. It's not for typical. So it's whoever you're talking to. They think, oh, it's only for me. So how did you, but I, but one thing is in common that the older grade teachers, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade and up, they seem to have trouble with it because it's. Uh, kind of out there in this kind of cutesy format. Did you have resistance at your school when you started this process? Oh, yes, ma'am. We absolutely had some resistance in the building. I had um, several, I had a lot of secondary teachers. And the the thing that I used to hear a lot of times was we're not dancing with the kids. And, you know, that was in reflection of us trying to put in some beginning of the day activities for the kids, brain smart starts is what conscious one would call them, where the kids are doing some kind of movement with music where we were breathing and doing some kind of eye contact and connecting with each other, you know, just brief two or three minute activities in the morning. And so it started off with, we're not dancing. And then, <laughs> you know, and now, you know, five, four or five years later, absolutely. Everybody, you know, in fact, it's one of my interview questions. How do you feel about dancing with the kids? And, you know, they, <laughs> the teachers are like, the people interviewing are like, what are you talking about? Can you define that? So, so now it's just part of who we are, but it was, they were very resistant because it did look, you know, exactly what you said. It looked very elementary. Some of the structures look very elementary for them. I certainly couldn't have taken them to the pre-K center and said, hey, this is what we're going to do. They would have thought oh, I was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So we just had to make some adaptions to it um, in, in the way we implement it and the way we rolled it out as well. And it had to be what they wanted to do versus, you know, what I wanted us to do. And how did that go? So talk to me about the rollout then. So... So we rolled it out, and again, it was with our the associate that we'd been working with um, had suggested that we start really doing some of the activities that we're wanting the teachers to work on with the children in the classrooms. We started doing those with the staff first. So the first couple of years that we were bringing in somebody to speak to our staff, the, the structures, for example, um, celebrations. So we want the kids, we want the teachers to, to do celebrations with their kids. And the way we did that was we structured it. We start every single meeting. I mean, from the beginning of time at Keller Middle School, we have started our meetings with what we call good things. And so we spend just a few minutes at the beginning of our, cl- of our meetings talking about good things in hopes that they would do it in their classrooms, that it would roll into their classrooms. And so that was just one example. We start every meeting with breathing in hopes that they would start every class with some kind of breathing exercise and some kind of mindfulness with their students. So everything that we really wanted to teach and for them to do in their classrooms, we started doing with the staff up front, you know, with them with the adults it had to start with the adults so and then they felt what it was like and it wasn't so scary and then they could roll in now I'm sure you still had some that were like okay I'm not doing that absolutely and so what ended up happening was we at some point along this journey had to say look this is what we feel like the staff wants to do if this makes you nervous if there's certain things about it that make you nervous come talk to us and we had them kind of reflect on what they want to learn more about or what they didn't want to learn more about and what ended up happening is all of them were all in I mean and if they weren't all in they eventually went to another campus or they got you know went to another profession it just wasn't their thing Um, because I think the ones that are here and the ones that stayed and stuck with it and wanted it realized that it may look 
childlike, but it really is about the adult. And and we've had several teachers that have really had some life transformations, um, professionally and personally, because of some of the things we've implemented on the campus. And it was the way the administrative team worked with the adults in the building. Do you have an, a, a, a story about that or an example you could share, or is this too private? Oh, no, absolutely. I have, um, I had a teacher that was here, and her story is that she was bumped. I think we were her seventh bump. So that means in our, in our district, um, if you have too many teachers at a school and they have to cut a teacher, this specific teacher um, was cut from seven campuses. And Whoa. So, that, so then she got placed on seven different campuses. And so, I mean, honestly, she was wounded certainly by that and she never I don't think she ever felt a part that she was part of a school family and so her first year with me she had some struggles and and had said some things and the behavior with the students there was some inappropriate behavior as far as you know we're not big yellers and screamers and she was she had a big 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 voice and and had said some things that were inappropriate and so I've had to have some tough conversations with her and about three quarters of the year of the way into the school year she was in my office and she was just exhausted she was exhausted from having conversations with me and and again I'm sure she was afraid I wasn't going to renew her contract or or whatnot and I finally just said look you're part of this family I'm not kicking you out you're going to be here next year so let's just work on what will make you feel better so that you're not having, you know, these behaviors as you work with children. For example, the, the yelling or right, yeah. some of the sarcastic comments. Yeah. And I want you to know, I ha- she was part of the team then. Her whole demeanor changed. And in fact, um, the next year, at the beginning of the year in the summer, she came up to the school and she said, hey... Here's what I want to do for the campus. I want to run a first year teachers at Keller, like a new teacher classes once a month so that they don't ever feel left out. And so she, you know, and to this day, we still have first year teachers meet once a month. And it was because of this teacher's plan. Now she's since retired. But she was, she became a very active faculty member. She was very involved. Do you have an actual story, like say one kid that you think, you know, this kid's not getting it. They're never going to get it. And, you know, we're just going to try to love you through it and teach you through it. And then we're going to give up on you and going to try again. But all of a sudden there's a miracle in front of you. I that- do. I can tell you several years ago, I'm going to say three years ago, and this was a group of girls and we had some tough girls and and they were fighting, like they came in, they were fighting, fighting, fighting all the time. And there was probably eight or nine of them. And they were fighting with each other. I mean, so it was just this girl's fighting this girl, and this girl's fighting this girl. And so and these are fist fights? Fist fights. Okay. Yeah, duking it out. All right. And, um, and so, which was new to us. We hadn't seen that. Um, but it was very, it was very, I mean, and that's just what they did. That's what they did at their homes or in their apartments or whatever. And so it was the skill they had learned. Right. And, and so one of the things we did was we, I, I pulled them in and it was kind of, I'm going to be honest with you. It terrified me to bring these nine girls in to the same table, <laughs> sit down and we're going to talk every single Tuesday morning together. And so we just spent time together and again, talking about, what does it look like from the other person's point of view? What does this look like from her point of view? Well, you're saying this and you're doing this and you're stirring the pot. We talked a lot about the girl drama and stirring the pot. And we talked, you know, we talked about their brain and that, that whole emotional state that you teach with, with conscious discipline. And, and I'm going to tell you, it took a few weeks of us getting together and then teachers started noticing them quoting some things that we had talked about to each other. Wow. So, so they would have some mess. You know, I, re- I remember very clearly a teacher saying, yeah, I heard, and I'm going to say their name was Susie and, and Joni. And I heard them in the hallway and one of them said, you're stirring the pot. You're doing just what we talked about with Miss Phelan. And I thought that's huge for them to understand what that means and and, I, and I, to be honest with you, um, 
I was over at our junior high that we feed into just the other day, and I was looking at some of their pictures, and I said, man, those two girls were in my girls' group. They fought all the time. And they said, they, they're stellar students over here. And wow. And they help other kids. And I just teared up because – because I know what they did as fifth graders, and to see them have that growth and be become leaders at the next school, they they're taking it with them. They're you taking bet. skills with them, and so that was a big deal. And that happens more frequently than not on this campus. I mean, I have a group. I know my assistant principal has a group. Both of my counselors have groups. So we're looking at kids that are having a hard time with their behavior, and we're trying to figure out. What are they asking for? What is their behavior telling us and working on that skill? And we're seeing success after success after success. Not that they don't mess up because they do. Oh, no, they're human. But there's a reflective piece and we know that there's growth and we can see it just just in discipline referrals. You know, you can see it in that. You can see it in the way they're handling themselves we see it every year. I mean, and it's really been an impact from conscious discipline. Well, so what would you say? Let's go to those discipline referrals. I mean, so before conscious discipline, you know, were they higher or are oh, now? Abso- they, okay, so you got any numbers? We got I, discipline referrals before and diff- discipline referrals after. So the first year, and I know this number because it's just such a huge, massive number. The first year, I know we had over. 1200 referrals when we were really comparing year to year the first year that we implemented conscious discipline when we when we really with fidelity came down with a plan and started implementing pieces of conscious discipline correctly with fidelity from the book everybody speaking the language that year they dropped from over 1200 to it was 50 percent, so it was under 600 wow yeah, so that first year is the one that really stands out because it was such a drastic drop. And it, it, and I got to tell you, it wasn't anything I did. It was the teachers seeing the behavior differently and not writing kids up and kicking them out of class, but working through whatever feelings the kids were having or whatever upset they were having. They were willing to work with the kids and find out what's going on. So automatically it dropped. And I'll tell you what else happened. Because those discipline referrals dropped, our scores went up that year. And our our state testing scores went up. So kids are in class more, so they're willing to listen. You know, they're learning to self-regulate and stay in class, and 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 it showed up academically as well. So how much? Do you have any data on how much the academics went up? or? So the first year that we implemented conscious discipline, and again, I'm really going off the top of my head, I can tell you that our biggest deficits were with special ed kids and our LEP population, our um, English language learners. Uh-huh. And, and I know their scores went up by at least 50% the first year. Wow. Um, yeah, so that was a big, that was a huge increase. Now, that's not typical. Um, we I know we went up in reading, I believe, five or seven points that year on the test. And I think with math, we went up probably about the same now our test has changed since we started implementing it so it's it's a little bit harder to keep track of the data but I can tell you we've been on an upward trajectory since we implemented conscious discipline and how was it last year then so how you've been into it for a while now so you're still continuing to grow and the and academics are still continuing to soar is that what you're saying oh absolutely absolutely Absolutely. Now, now, what about your culture? Did you have a change before conscious discipline after the school culture itself? Can, does it feel different in there with it the does. staff and everything? It does feel different. And I don't, and you know, now again, five years in, you know, you don't, because I live here, um, it just feels like home for me. So this is what it is. But when people come in all the time, parents, visitors from the district, visitors from outside the district, they'll say, it just feels different here. It feels nice. It feels comfortable. It's welcoming. And our staff, and not that the staff didn't get along before, but our staff now has skills. I'm going to use conflict resolution as one of them. Our staff, when before conscious discipline, they may, if they were in a team planning, for example, the reading team is planning. If they had conflict, 
they would just rah, 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 and gossip and and you know talk bad about this person after they left the meeting or they don't know what they're doing or they're doing this now they're willing to say hey hey becky you know today in planning you said something it kind of hurt my feelings what did you mean but i mean they're willing to work it out because they're a family because they want to work it out they don't want to feel yucky and push those feelings down and you know, divide the school. It really is, it feels different with the staff. And so because they feel differently and because they're willing to work with each other, then same thing with the kids. Yeah, they're so willing to work. Yeah, right. it just flows down. And working with parents. You know, when we talk to parents, um, we try to see it from the parents' point of view. I now, mean, do you have, have piece. you taught the parents? I mean, are the parents familiar with conscious discipline and how do you go about doing that? Yes, ma'am. So we've done it several different ways. In the beginning, we either would have a speaker come in and talk to the parents and work through conscious discipline, or we would do it ourselves, just a night, you know, a night program and maybe teach the brain or, um, you know, teach something about conflict resolution or teach right. something about empathy yeah. or whatever. Um, we've developed that. A couple of years ago, we, we started setting up stations where the parents could just go through the stations and the kids could teach the stations. And that was just about once a year we did that. And then this year, and this is my absolute favorite way we've done it, this year when we bring the parents in, we bring them in after every marking period. So they come in four times a year after the kids get their report cards and they have a conference with their own child. But one of the things that they do is we set up the gym and we do different different stations, different centers. And about three of the stations have to do with conscious discipline. And they have to do with what we're working on in the classroom with conscious discipline. So if we're teaching the, the first nine weeks, one of the activities was we're teaching the brain. So the kids teach the brain to their parents. They also, wow. yeah. there's, there's one station where they do a brain smart start and they do one of the dances, one of the activities with their parents. Um, one of the things we do is... Uh, the, the last one we had hurtful and helpful words that parents can use with their kids and it was kind of a little matching game that they could do so then they take a piece of paper home that explains what they just learned in this you know at this center time and so and, and we get about 50 percent of our parents coming with their students and so it's not us barking it at them it's their children teaching it to them with a teacher there to facilitate it so we we feel like wow. that's been very helpful now, did you, before conscious discipline, did you have fifty percent of your parents show up? We did not. We did not. Mm -mm. It, I mean, it was that's tough a lot. to get parents here. Oh, it absolutely yeah. is a lot. It absolutely is a lot. And we tried to just create a family environment. You know, we know that if the parents are connected to the schools, the kids are going to be more successful. And so that's our goal: connect with families and the kids and the staff. Just get everybody in and the community, for that matter. Okay, so let me ask you this. Now, Conscious Discipline is a relationship-based program. I mean, it's about safety, connection, and problem-solving, not about rewards or any of that. But it really is about making these connections. Now, your kids change classes, right? Are yes, ma'am. How many times do they change a day? Five. Five times. So now, how do you build those relationships with the teachers when they're changing that often? Because this is what I'm asked all the time. We can't do it in middle school because they change classes and... I can't do this and I can't do that. So how did you work around that? How do you get these bonds built so strong that they carry from teacher to teacher to teacher? So one of the biggest things that has has been so important for us, and it's one of the things that I fight for every year when we start doing staffing with the district, is that our teachers are teamed, our kids are teamed together. So they have a common reading math science and social studies teacher that's a family that's their group together and they'll a, a group of 100 kids is going to share these four teachers um, oh i see yes yeah and so that that's the beginning of it but they also start the day with one teacher and that's their homeroom teacher but it's also their teacher for the last period of the day so that teacher will see them when they come in in the morning and if they see something's going on between classes all the teachers are close together that teacher can relay a message, hey, you know, Diane's having a bad day today, just be on the lookout. She may need to go to the safe place, you know, or whatever. Um, and then they end the day with that student so they can check in at the end of the day. And so that was a big piece. But the reality is that the teachers and the teachers that are really good, that have the best relationships, are spending that time in the beginning and throughout the year and at the beginning of every class 
doing whatever it is they do to connect with those kids. So they're greeting the kids. They're doing some kind of connecting activity as soon as they come in that room. They're doing team building. They're celebrating with the kids. They're wishing well. They're teaching the kids empathy. And that doesn't take much time to get more time with the kids, if that makes right. sense. Right. So they found out if they invest this time. Yes, ma'am. Even though they have, in my, their mind, a limited amount of time with them. If they invest yes, these three, four minutes or two exactly. or three minutes, then they're going to have them in their hands to teach them for yes. the rest of the time. And, and I have a teacher that says it like this. I mean, I can't, I quote him all the time. He says, used to, I would spend 45 minutes trying to get them for 10 in a class. He said, now I can spend four minutes at the beginning of the class and I have them the other 45. Right. That makes sense to me. Right. So um, now is that your, uh, do you advocate for that homeroom in the end of the day or is that a typical uh, process happening in middle school? Um, I have advocated for it. We have made time in our schedule. It's not typical at most, in my district, it's not typical at most districts. A lot of schools do a homeroom time once a week. Right. Um, but it's that important to me that the kids have that adult that sees them in the morning and the afternoon to check in. I mean, and it really is about the relationship and checking in with that kid. And so, uh, you know, it's important to us. So we make sure that that's in our schedule. We have not let that go. We don't let the time, the minutes go on that just because it's that important. And that's where we teach um, our conscious discipline skills. So one month we're going to teach positive intent. One month we're going to teach composure, you know, that's where that learning happens is in that homeroom time. So it's important that it's there for us. Okay, so let's kind of bring this around. So let's say I'm a middle school teacher or any teacher, and I don't know much about conscious discipline, or I know a lot and I've just forgot what I knew, you know, because we kind of get off track at times. So what would be the next step? So if you had three things I could do tomorrow, three things, do this tomorrow what would be your three next steps that someone could hear this podcast and go okay I'm going to go do these three things tomorrow what would they be I would start off by greeting every kid at the door yourself make high eye contact with them high five them fist bump them or whatever it is so that you see every single kid coming in your classroom and that you can make a conscious effort to notice that child and see if they're coming in bringing something and and looking for those signals that that may they may be sending you that you wouldn't have noticed if you're at your desk getting ready for the class uh, so and those signals are like you know my life is not going as I'd hoped. exactly like yeah. please help me because at yeah. this age they're not going to say please help me they're just yeah. going to have some kind of body language telling you that okay so I think I think that's a super easy thing to do I think also you know connect with them. Give them two minutes at that beginning of the class to talk about what's going on. Share something fun with me. Share some good things that are happening in your life right now so that you know what's going on and what drives that kid. And then again, I am a strong believer in the taking the time to teach the kids the the brain states and the breathing component. And I know that's a big thing, um, but that whole, if you could just take three deep breaths every time you, you move to some other activity just to bring them back together, um, it'll start those kids off on the right foot. I mean, that, that's the three things I would do. Easy and those are all do. very doable. Very Absolutely. doable. Absolutely. Now, again, Diane, I want to thank you. I mean, you have uh, broken open the middle school and, and, and you've shown people it can be done, and it took a lot of passion and commitment and dedication, and uh, certainly you have the success that's paid off, but it's not an easy route. So I want to thank you on behalf of uh, children that might not at that age say it. Well, so, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us today and sharing your expertise with others. Thank you. And for the rest of you listening, until next time. I wish you well. For more episodes of Real Talk with Real Teachers by Dr. Becky Bailey, visit ConsciousDiscipline.com forward slash podcasts. 
You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app.